Good morning and welcome to State Studio for the second day of the digital symposium Empathic AI to celebrate for the uh, opening of the exhibition uh, Near Futures and Quasi Worlds uh, to celebrate five years of starts innovation at the nexus of science, technology and the arts, an initiative of the European Commission. Since its foundation, a state has been working passionately to bring forward new opportunities for collaboration and exchange between scientists, artists and the public in order to explore new ideas for a sustainable future. It is therefore a great joy and honor to be able to host this absolutely fantastic program and exhibition here at State Studio. Yesterday, on the first day of the symposium, which is organized in collaboration with the German Center for Competency in Culture and Creative Industries, we witnessed a fascinating program exploring how artists and creatives contribute to the development of artificial intelligence. Today, on the second day of the opening program, we will further go into this topic to present a dialogue between uh, the artists Evelina Domnitsch and Dimitri uh, Gelfand, both um, here present in the exhibition, together with the physicist Tommaso Colaco. This is followed by a tour through the exhibition with the curator of the show, Manuel Sirauki, and a starts talk between the artists Ralf Becker, uh, Rebecca Johnson, Simon Denny, and Paul uh, Lukowicz, moderated by Eva Kaili. But before we start with this brilliant program, uh, it is my great honor to hand over for greetings from the STARTS initiative and the European Commission, represented by Ralph Doom, followed by greetings from the Vice President of the Fraunhofer Association, Professor Ralph Werschbun, and the curator of the exhibition, Manuel Sirauki. Uh, thank you, uh, Christian, for the introduction. Um, indeed, this, this exhibition takes stock of five years of starts. Uh, I, I think the curator Manuel Siraki uh, from Guggenheim Bilbao uh, shows a breadth of possible interactions of art with, sci with science and technology. Uh, the works exposed demonstrate the various forms in which artists and engineers uh, or scientists can engage in a dialogue. Um, Manuel's curation follows the established canon of art exhibits. Um, he thereby puts starts on the map of contemporary art. Uh, while starts is, of course, uh, more oriented towards industry and technological innovation, it is intriguing to see these works as artworks, uh, but then to go back again and see them as works that inspire new pathways in science or reflections in technology. Uh, my, my thinking on starts uh, has evolved over the five years, uh, but the core idea of starts has always been this feedback loop between a science thinking, a technology thinking, and an art thinking in digital space. Um, I had often the Bauhaus in the back of my mind, of course. Uh, Roberto Viola mentioned it yesterday. Um, the Bauhaus explored how public space was changed by industrial a revolution and how this influenced our daily lives. Um, this is exactly what STARTS is doing with the digital. It investigates how the digital has changed social space and thereby our daily routines. Think of iPhone, think of social media, think of Google search. Um, the critical point in Bauhaus and in STARTS is that artists and engineers were willing to leave their comfort and their certainties about their respective roles. I think this is especially in Europe an important aspect of, of bringing together uh, these different types and, and ways of thinking. Um, Rafi Ganador yesterday gave an intriguing definition of starts, which I would like to share with you today again. He called starts an ecosystem of imagination. Indeed, start allows artists to create a, create a free space of exploration of technology and of uh, creating purposeful, meaningful uses of technology before any company takes over and creates a product. Uh, for example, in, in, in the Starts Project Mindspaces, in which uh, Rafi Ganador is involved, 
uh, they imagine a new cityscape among artists, the architects, neuroscientists, mobility and smart cities experts. Um, so not only the concept of starts has evolved, also the activities have shifted. Currently, we have four pillars of starts. The starts prize, which is now a very well known prize in the art world, but also in the industry world. Starts residences that were put to the foreground, thanks also to efforts of IRCAM at Centre Pompidou. Um, the lighthouse pilots, uh, of which Mindscapes, uh, in which Refik Anatoly is involved, is an example. And finally, the Starts Academy is the fourth pillar, where artists and engineers together uh, teach young adults, <coughs> sorry, teach young adults um, use and also uh, critical thinking about uh, digital technologies. Among all these fluid concepts and, and shifting activities, it has always been stars artists who have created inspiring works. Uh, and you will have an occasion to see today uh, at 11, uh, the guided tour of Manuel, and you will see these, these, these various different um, works. And uh, uh, I think you will enjoy them. Thank you for your attention. Ja, guten Morgen auch von meiner Seite aus. Welcome from my side. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to give some words here to Christian Rauch and also congratulations to Ralf Damm and the European Union uh, for this excellent idea to go to the State Gallery. Fraunhofer is one of the largest societies for applied research and since more than 10 years we bring together science and arts, leaving the usual past and changing perspectives. And for this, we have a series starting again more than 10 years ago, Science and Art in Dialogue. And this was more a very simple dialogue last 10 years ago. And as Ralph Dahm explained, this has changed substantially. And uh, we built, therefore, a real um, dialogue uh, between artists and science, created a network. And we don't call it START because we're scientists, so we started with STEM. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and integrating the A, so we call it STEAM network. And this was created 2018. And we launched different formats, uh, like artist and lab or artist and fab. And we have, um, since two years now, very nice works, which we also uh, show in the State Gallery and have a cooperation with Christian Rauch. And therefore, uh, I congratulate you to go to the State Gallery. This can be really a place for start or STEAM activities in Germany. So for us, this was very important. How can we inspire it by art and vice versa? So we really to look what are the parallels of the research work? How can we benefit from a mutual dialogue so that art understands science and science arts? And our first workshop was really to understand the different languages. So I'm a material scientist. I want to understand how material looks like. So we have microscope. And the artist explained me, no, I'm not interested in what it looks like, I want to know how it feels like. So we started to understand the different languages. And we saw, we, we have in the second profile phase, we saw really that we have the same motivation. Science is working by errors, it's going forward by errors, by differences. And there we have a similar motivation. And currently we have a discussion about fake, fake and truth, because science has to be true or has to try to find the truth. And this is obviously a very nice discussion also with art. I'd like to motivate you also to discuss about this topic, perhaps, um, um, together with the artists on this um, session. Uh, currently, we have um, a very nice project here, which goes, uh, and I congratulate Mr. Manuel Kuraki uh, on this topic, Empathic at I, because we have one artisan lab project currently running, which called Brain Palace, Brain Patterns. And this will be also an exhibit later this year in the State Gallery. And as part of an artistic research project, a light and sound installation will be developed as an art project, and the appearance of which is controlled interactively by the brain waves of the viewer itself. And we have researchers from our neural lab of the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering, which will take up the idea of power of thoughts. And we have our Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Mathematics, 
which looks at the patterns of thoughts to interlocking research projects that explore the new ways of using AI supported neurofeedbacks while integrating artistic approaches. So I think that's really a good starting point and a great project to go on the point of um, Empathic at AI, and it fits perfectly to the German EU presidency, uh, which really goes for data serenity and the European way of AI. And so congratulations again to the EU to have these great projects and congratulations to Christian Rauch to be the host and also congratulations to Manuel Sakaki for this excellent um, exhibition. Thank you very much, Ralf Eschborn.
Good morning. Good morning to everyone and uh, welcome back. I am very happy to be part of this uh, today amazing event and to introduce uh, today's session that is also part of the extraordinary opening of uh, uh, Near Futures and Quasi Worlds. Um, it is uh, an honor to be a collaborator of STARTS and to be able to undertake a dialogue of this depth and this ambition in, uh, in an exhibition space and, and for a project such as this, Near Futures and Quasi Worlds. And uh, today, alongside the exhibition opening that will take place this evening and where you are all physically or uh, digitally invited, we also have a, I think, very, very unusual and, and very compelling program of conversations and presentations this morning. I'll be very happy to give you a tour in a few minutes, but before that, there is a dialogue that I think is of utmost interest for what is also at the center of this exhibition. It's a dialogue between Evelina Dominic and Dimitri Gelfand, artists in the exhibition and artists uh, very, very connected to radical uh, advanced scientific research and uh, physicist um, and theoretician Tommaso Calarco. They will be talking about the unspeakable matters uh, at stake in quantum physics and the artistic research that uh, Dimitri and Evelina have uh, been carrying through for the past few years. I think it is uh, an amazing event. I welcome you all to this full day of uh, art, science and technology experience. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy it.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Evelina Domnich, and I'd like to first of all thank uh, the START program for an amazing opportunity to work with the leading research groups in quantum physics over two years. And um, today we are talking with Tomasa Kalarka, who is one of our collaborators on this amazing journey. Good morning, and thank you for, for having us here in this very, very, very exciting setting. So, uh, a curvilinear ion trap, uh, Hilbert Hotel probes the perceptual tension between a granular unfolding of reality characterized by discrete entities separated in space and a fluid, continuous experience of reality comprised of waves, Fourier transforms, and semi-infinities. In the artwork, we encounter an exotic state of matter known as a Coulomb crystal, which is a gas phase, in our case, air at room temperature, where charged particles, here uh, hollow glass microspheres, assemble into a dynamic crystalline structure while being levitated by electric fields. These microspheres also trace the shape of these quadrupolar electric fields. So we are simultaneously confronted by uh, a quasi-solid and an oscillating field matrix within a gas. Uh, ultimately, uh, this merging of states is, uh, is punctuated by uh, the square-shaped orbits that uh, certain microspheres uh, assume, uh, which we equate to the infinitesimal shuffling of guests between rooms in Hilbert's endless hotel. Or we can also imagine uh, the orbital dance of stars in the cosmic gas. So, Tamaza, you probably never stay at Hilbert Hotel, but I do suspect that you dwell in Hilbert space sometimes. Can you tell us what you do? Well, in, fa <laughs> in fact, I was a little lost in, in seeing these mesmerizing images. Every time I see them, uh, I get captured by, by your work, but we will dwell on that later on. So what I'm doing, well, um, in general terms, uh, I'm working on developing quantum technologies, so which really is taking the beauty and the mystery, if you wish, uh, of such phenomena such as uh, superposition and entanglement, and maybe we will have opportunity to, to explain a little bit, to talk a little bit about that, and takes them straight from philosophy into technology. Um, in the sense that uh, some, uh, you know, very deep and fundamental questions about even existence of reality or speakability, as John Bell used to say, of the physical world is then taken into applications. So we use the Hilbert spaces and properties of Hilbert spaces, um, for instance, the linear superposition such that objects can be at the same time in two different states, in two different positions, for instance, or as I said, entanglement, the correlation at very long distance between quantum objects, we use them for such, uh, one could even say, mundane purposes, uh, such as uh, security of communication or power of uh, computing. And there we speak about quantum computers and quantum communication devices. And my personal work is, you know, in tiny adjustments of the dynamics. This is why I was so mesmerized, because, you know, there are these very small oscillations uh, that take place in the in the hotel, and what I am doing is really to uh, adjust to engineer, if you wish, interaction those external fields, which, for instance, levitate the particles in an ion trap, and you know tune them into bringing 
those objects to such completely unconceivable and unspeakable states, which we can then use in terms of some um, applications for technology. And I also want to mention that you work already in this uh, st stage of what is called by physicists second quantum revolution, which uh, happened exactly after such uh, some concepts of uh, quantum mechanics, of quantum theory, were taken out of the philosophical realm into experimental realm. And um, so, of course, in the, let's say, first stage of uh, uh, quantum theory, all, all the measurements um, were done with big, big groups of atoms, statistically. And as I understand, using more classical statistics. And uh, as we go further in uh, second quantum revolution, the statistics get more and more interesting and uh, less classical, but uh, we'll, we'll stay away from that. And uh, so yes, the second quantum uh, revolution uh, allowed um, physicists to do experiments and measurements and observations on single entities, such as single atoms, uh, single ions, and exactly by using ion traps with a device yeah. that we are presenting at this exhi exhibition, an ion trap, and uh, which allowed to have a containerless trapping or containerless containment just with the help of uh, an electric field or magnetic field, in our case, electric field. And it's quite fascinating that in this exhibition, right behind me, you see a dress uh, of Iris van Herpen, which is a, a frozen idea. I mean, it's a, a frozen magnetic field. It's not really a magnetic field, but a, a, an artist's visualization of it made into a dress. And it's quite fascinating to be in such an exhibition. And in our work, you can observe this very delicate uh, oscillations uh, of electric field uh, with your eyes. Of course, you have to be very, very patient and you have to tune your senses to extremely subtle domains. But maybe now we can talk a little bit about entanglement and second quantum revolution. And uh, Yes. And um, I like uh, many things of what you said, and one which relates to uh, this aspect is you mentioned, you know, um, that from philosophy it was taken to the lab. But actually, the reverse is also true, in the sense that the lab was taken into philosophy. In which <laughs> sense? In the sense that the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, uh, they said, I think it was Schrödinger, uh, he said, you know, it is ridiculous to imagine that you can experiment with single atoms. This would have unavoidably ridiculous consequences. It would be much more reasonable to think of raising a pterodactyl in a zoo. So I have no idea why he chose the pterodactyl, but I mean, that's what he said. So just to say, I mean, it's totally inconceivable. It makes no sense. And now, and here is something which for me was the uh, entrance door into quantum technology in the second quantum revolution. Um, I mean, I remember more than 20 years ago when I was, uh, um, you know, in my second week, I think, as a postdoc in Innsbruck. And it is the same lab in which we met with you um, when we were starting to discuss possible developments of your work in, in the context of this starts project. Um, and so I take my bike out of the, that cellar 20 years ago and in comes a black limousine and out comes the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama had come there to Innsbruck to see something that the founding fathers thought is impossible and that we also, all of us, learned in school that it would be impossible, and also my children even, which is seeing a single atom with your eye. So in the lab, there is a microscope. And then, you know, between the, your eyepiece and the atom, which is exactly levitating in an ion trap exactly as, as your artwork, uh, well, there are only glass lenses. And if you wait a little bit, you know, you tune in, that's exactly the, the thing that you have to do in the darkness, then you can see it with your eye. And this really is the foundation of the second quantum revolution. Because, as you mentioned, 
uh, the first quantum theory was done and developed um, with many, many particles. And it was thought, it was a purely thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment, uh, to experiment with individual particles. But such colleagues as Rainer Blatt, you know, in whose lab His Holiness was visiting, as well as many others, they have developed the capability to manipulate individual particles. And so, as much as today's technologies, digital technologies, they rely completely on quantum mechanics without knowing how to manipulate quantum mechanical objects, we could not have, you know, transistors, lasers, uh, you know, processors, digital computers, anything like that. Well, uh, going beyond that is what you can do when you manipulate those individual particles. And there you have individual atoms, for instance. Use them as bits, qubits for a quantum computer. You have individual photons and use them for quantum communication. And here is where entanglement comes in. Because this superposition, when you manipulate them individually, you can have a superposition of two photons, for instance, or electrons, being both in some up state plus down state. So they are correlated, zero, zero, one, one. Now, when I separate them, you know, beyond the borders of uh, the webcam of my computer and maybe many miles away, then what happens is that they can still retain that property. So there is correlation. So it means that if someone, for instance, here in Cologne, will have one of those entangled particles, and I would observe that, and I will find, okay, it's up, then immediately I know that also the particle in Berlin, if you have this entangled particle to, together with me, then that your particle will be in one. And this happens with a perfect correlation only if no one has interfered with the process. It, only if the entanglement was undisturbed. And so we can be sure that no one has listened in, no one has eavesdropped on our communication channel, and we can use this to transmit secure communication. So there is that direct connection between those uh, almost philosophical aspects, uh, you know, and the lab going into philosophy in a sense, and philosophy going into the lab, and then using this for such technological applications, which nowadays can be found, you know, you can purchase devices which do this, and you can put it on satellites. Uh, the Chinese government has done that. The European Union is going to do that in the next uh, few years. And so really, this is delivering some very tangible effect to society, very much as today's quantum, first quantum revolution applications, such as the computer, the mobile phone, Facebook and Twitter, those are all children of the first quantum revolution. In the same way, in the future, we are looking forward to having, you know, the results of the second one, where we manipulate individual particles very much like is visible in your wonderful work. <laughs> and I just want to conclude that uh, Hilbert Hotel is just a, a little warmer up. Uh, so we're really working on a much more complex uh, project that is um, called Atom Chasm where we do want to create an artwork with a few single atoms with um, so-called Coulomb crystal that Dmitry described earlier. So we will be looking into very, very high vacuum. In Laser a, cooled. Uh, at, at an ensemble of laser cooled atoms that you will be able to see with a naked eye and to see not just the electric field interacting with air molecules, whatever noise is in the universe, but with individual properties of these individual quantum objects that behave quantum mechanically. And Such as quantum jumps. And you can observe quantum jumps. That is another fascinating uh, causality breaking experience. So in a way, when I, I cannot even predict the experience, what I will see unless this artwork is until the artwork is built. And I'm extremely excited even to have an opportunity to work on something like that. And uh, by experiencing world on such a deep quantum level where everything is so uh, counterintuitive and not the way we uh, build our conceptual frame of the world. Uh, it is like 
standing on the edge of a precipice and uh, experiencing the unspeakable. Thank you, Tommaso, for an amazing conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much for your amazing work, which really opens one's eyes into what really is unspeakable.
Well, hi again. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning in this uh, second uh, event of this uh, morning session, uh, Near Futures Quasi World Opening, uh, Empathic AI, Art Creates Industry, Today Conference. There are many, many um, events, many uh, interests, many uh, incredible people taking part in, uh, in this uh, symposium, in this uh, very, I think, unusual gathering around the five years of starts and uh, all that has been accomplished in the framework of uh, all the pillars of, of starts, lighthouse projects, residencies, prices, mind spaces, reframe. And I'm very honored to be uh, a collaborator in this network and uh, to have uh, worked uh, on this exhibition near Futures Quasi Worlds, um, delving into the very rich very complex, uh, extremely fascinating history of starts uh, for these past years. I've had the uh, enormous pleasure of collaborating with Silvana Fiorese, who has also uh, worked on the curatorial aspect in this uh, adventure. But uh, I have to thank, uh, first and foremost, starts, uh, Ralph Doom, uh, Luis Miguel Girao, Patricia Delgado, who, has, uh, who have put all their efforts into this uh, impulse and in, in, in this exhibition. I also want to thank Stars, uh, uh, um, State Studio, excuse me, State Studio for hosting the exhibition, for the like uh, amazing uh, coordination for the logistics of the show, and um, certainly I want to thank all of the artists in the exhibition, everybody was uh, taken part in, in, in making this possible. Also, some of the uh, galleries, representatives, collaborators of the artists who have helped enormously to bring all these works together. And we're very happy about the result. I will uh, say a few words of introduction about this project before we start this um, online guided tour. The uh, exhibition is of course, one of many possible formulations of a field. Uh, we call it near futures quasi-worlds um, because in that concept, in, 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 in that accumulation of words, uh, in, it's, it's like an additive uh, sync term, um, near plus futures plus quasi plus worlds, um, we find some sort of cluster, a conceptual cluster where um, the encounter between art, science, and technology can be summarized. Both uh, artists, scientists, and technologists seem to live in this aboutness, in this um, imminence of what's going to happen, what is going to occur, what's uh, uh, just near accomplishment. And then there is never a final accomplishment. Research is always pursued and uh, pushed forward and forward. Uh, as well as the limits of research. And I think that's the, the common spirit that animates all the projects in the exhibition and, and at large, all the project that starts is fostering. The, the show um, gathers 11 artists, but again, that's not exactly fair because everybody uh, is very much in a collaborative spirit and everybody is calling upon uh, various levels of expertise in various fields. We are in, in, in the middle of a, an, an incredibly dynamic uh, space of cross-pollination, co-creation, collaboration. The exhibition uh, is uh, one common space. It is very physical. I have to emphasize that because when people speak about technology, when they speak about science and research and art and post-digital, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, post-internet art, we tend to think of synthetic images, intangibles of uh, multiple types, and uh, let's say realizations that remain at the level of hypothesis. This is absolutely not the case, as the exhibition shows, in, I think, in all its uh, consistency. The artworks resulting and the uh, projects resulting from these collaborations are very material, are, are to be experienced with one's full body, with, with one's full sensorium. 
And it is very important that this exhibition is seen personally. I can only uh, insist in inviting all of you who are watching this program, this morning program, to come this evening and uh, to register for the opening uh, at State Studio. Please uh, join us. Uh, it's a very, very long stretch. And that's precisely to be able to accommodate everyone during the afternoon and evening opening. So please make sure that you get, uh, get here and, and we're in the center of Berlin. It's, 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 a, it's an amazing setting for, for what we're doing. So um, going back to the exhibition near Futures Quasi Worlds, um, it is a framework of uh, radical speculation, uh, of radical anticipation of futures and worlds. And we will see that in every uh, one of the works that uh, I will describe in, in a few seconds. Um, the exhibition has two separate conceptual territories that I also um, describe. The um, first of these conceptual territories, I uh, have dubbed it uh, Worlds in Progress. And that's where the exhibition starts. Imagine that we are crossing the door now and we're going to uh, face the first artwork in, in, in our visit. As you can see in the image, uh, there are two screens, one vertical and one horizontal. We are in front of Refik Anadol's Melting Memories. This is one of the many manifestations of this uh, acclaim project. What we can see in the exhibition space is one monitor showing all the massive data processing uh, that is occurring um, after the uh, retrieval of uh, uh, like uh, brain information, neural information from uh, the uh, uh, electroencephalogram that is being practiced on the artist. And the result is a visualization of uh, neural processes. It is a very abstract and compelling image that is um, really, um, hold one second. Uh, yes, sorry, yes. Um, it is an image that constantly moves, that is constantly changing, and that brings us to face some, uh, I think, overwhelming complexity. The project was developed uh, at the Neuroscape uh, Laboratory uh, uh, at the University of California, where Rafik Anadol uh, resides. He's based in Leiva. He studied uh, in Europe, and he's from Turkish origin. And uh, this project was developed uh, as a study into brain processes there is a, a, a medical and neurosci neuroscientific interest to it, but there is also a very immediate aesthetic uh, and provocative uh, vision of uh, all these processes. Uh, Refik Anadol is an artist uh, working with new media in, in, in digital uh, visualization, and he is very well known for his immersive spaces, for his audiovisual performances. And I think this is uh, one very, very compelling example of, of what he does. If we continue in the exhibition space uh, past Refik Anadol's piece, we will find a very similar texture. It's a, a low relief in three uh, different uh, plates. All of them are made out of plaster, but they come with a lamp. It's a very uh, enigmatic object. And uh, it is the work of Felicie de Tiendor, a French artist who worked with uh, a division of the CNRS, uh, the French National uh, Research Institute, um, to um, bring us as close as possible to the experience of the horizon on planet Mars. The um, laboratory that she worked with, uh, specialized in uh, dynamic meteorology, helped the artist uh, come up with uh, these um, topographies of major sites in uh, the geography of Mars. And the action of the lamp is actually a simulation of I mean, in a very, very accurate simulation, proportionally uh, to the actual height and intensity of sunlight along the line when the uh, sun is moving to its sunset. Um, this is 
uh, of course, a very uncommon experience. It's not only a visualization of the horizon, it is also a visualization of the encounter between the horizon, the horizon and the landscape. It's a very, very uh, radical experience of, of outer space, thanks to the work of, uh, of, of uh, Felicity and Dorve. We, we, we can keep moving past this work to the next piece in the exhibition, which also um, deals with um, the cosmos and, and, and astrophysics. Uh, as well as uh, Felici was working with uh, um, astrophysicists uh, to develop her own vision of the planets. Here, uh, Evelina Dominic and Dimitri Gelfand work uh, rather in the field of cosmology and uh, theoretical physics to develop a Hilbert Hotel. Hilbert Hotel is actually, as you see, uh, very small and uh, mysterious uh, purple object. When, when one comes close, uh, there is the encounter of a parade, a microscopic parade of hollow crystal microspheres. Um, this parade is actually the direct reference of the Hilbert Hotel as a trope in cosmology and mathematics. Uh, uh, the, 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 this metaphor originates in the work of uh, uh, David Hilbert, a mathematician who at some point formulated the question, how could we imagine uh, an infinitely large hotel being filled by an infinite number of incoming guests. And in this projection of the necessity of matching two infinite sequences that are uh, working in a syncopated way, um, we can see the parade of these crystals. Um, the artists also uh, relate this work to the uh, um, writing of uh, George Gamow who is uh, an important uh, uh, theoretical physicist in, in recent history, who was uh, responsible for the, the evolution, the advancement of uh, um, the inflationist theory of the cosmos. So in this space, uh, we see, we experience uh, the parade of uh, these crystals. It is another dynamic work. And I believe it is very important uh, to uh, emphasize that in this exhibition, particularly in this first uh, sequence, there is um, a very strong kinetic element, meaning that not only the works are tangible and three-dimensional, they are also um, four-dimensional or multi-dimensional. They are not only volumes, they are not only beyond the effect of surface that the digital world can make us think uh, contemporary art would be. It, they are also moving. And our experience, our navigation of space, is um, directly determined by the temporalities of these, um, of these works. So that is for uh, Evelina uh, and Dimitri's work, which is Again, you know, it's absolutely mandatory that you come and, and, and see it uh, physically, do experience it, uh, experience it um, materially. It is uh, a dynamic work, a kinetic work, and uh, so is the, the piece that is next to them. Um, a, a very different device. It is a work by Ralph Becker, um, an artist working with, um, let's say, a, 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 a complexity-oriented mindset. Uh, in this piece called uh, Putting the Pieces Back Together, uh, Ralph Becker devised a machine that is made of uh, thousands, I think the exact number is 1,250,000 stepper motors that are rotating in a binary uh, mode, either clockwise or counterclockwise, and they react to each other. They have this very uh, sensitive polarization, so at, as soon as they sort of pressure each other, they, they, they change direction. And in this, uh, in this very um, choral uh, process, these objects um, start locking each other, start composing patterns, and producing this, this, this landscape, this very... Um, very compelling and very difficult to grasp uh, um, image of collective action, of, of a, a, a mechanic made out of uh, many, many uh, actors. And so these uh, mechanical actors are also uh, in a constant resetting um, and re 
formation, recomposition uh, of the patterns. It is a piece that, exactly as the other, speaks uh, to us about um, densities, complexities, time, um, rhythm and arrhythmia and composition and, and, and a certain dimensionality that is beyond what we can simply perceive physically. These are the works in the first floor and uh, there is another work in the basement that continues this uh, line of, uh, of, of, of discussion within the exhibition's concept. It is a work that introduces uh, another variable in this, in this uh, equation, which is the variable of the living. We are now not only in the geographical and the topographical, we are not only in the topos, we are also in the bios, in the, in the um, biotopography of uh, this accumulation of soil where um, a multitude of living organisms and particularly earthworms are going about their daily business and, and producing these um, itineraries, these uh, grooves and these marks in the very complex multi-layered monolith that is in the center of the gallery, as this very, very dark space. Uh, it is quite surprising to observe that these groups made by the earthworms are not very, very far from the same appearance uh, you can find in the Martian geography, uh, in the plaster low reliefs that I was pointing at uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, here, the work of Kasia Molga and Scanner is oriented toward the production of a soundscape, very complex, hybrid, live musical composition, um, where the sound of these organisms within the soil uh, it produces all these cracking um, noises that um, give away this, this, this dense tapestry where one gets um, in, 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 during the visit. Again, it is very important to be here physically to uh, experience, uh, experience this uh, environment with one's own body. Um, uh, we uh, have to come back up into the first floor and from there into the uh, second floor of the exhibition, the second level where I am now, um, one goes into the first gallery there. And, and the encounter now is, again, another twist of these worlds in progress. We are in the domain of the living, but we are in the domain of the encoding of the living, the translation of the living into code. This piece you are seeing now uh, in the other screen is uh, I'm Humanity by Etsuko Yakushimaru. It's a music project. Etsuko Yakushimaru is a, uh, a very important uh, pop star in, in Japan. And uh, this project received one of the awards uh, of, uh, of the Starts uh, initiative in, in, in recent years. I'm Humanity is a project where uh, the artist decided not only to compose a, a very successful pop song, but also to encode it uh, as DNA and to um, translate it into the genome of a, a microorganism, a, a type of protozoa that is known for its uh, high capacity to replicate. And um, the idea, uh, what the artist uh, called her desire to produce post-humanity music was that by encoding this song into the genome of these microorganisms, uh, one could imagine these beings uh, existing beyond the scope of humanity on Earth and carrying many millions of years after our extinction as a species, this song and humanity in it. And it's a, um, of course the song is not, uh, um, it's not very epic, it's rather uh, lyrical and cute and it speaks about the fragility of human passions and, 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 and human life. It is, a, it is a beautiful example of, of, of Japanese, uh, Japanese pop music uh, in its, uh, uh, I think in its naive and, and, and very um, ironic complexity. Next to this work, uh, and again, uh, considering the encoding of human life, there is a, a project that has um, much darker connotations, but well, um, unless we consider uh, the extinction of humanity um, 
you know, a dark prospect. This, uh, you just saw the, the picture of uh, Pablo Fisa as uh, an activist who was murdered in Greece in 2013 by the hordes of neo-Nazi uh, party Golden Down. And uh, it was a very, very barbaric act that remained, uh, well, largely um, mm, opaque to the public eye, and that is why the family of uh, Pablo Fisas, uh, who was a musician, very, very well known in, in, in Greece, uh, commissioned forensic architecture uh, to study the elements that had led to the process being, well, uh, getting stuck. Um, Forensic Architecture is an agency operating from uh, Central St. Martin's School in London. It is a, um, a, a very international and, uh, and um, justice-driven uh, art project. I think it's a project of aesthetics uh, rather than art because it deals with perception, with what is key to art but is also key to human public life. And Forensic Architecture is specialized in reconstruction, in recomposition of events, and in the uh, refiguration of what was before their work, um, let's say, buried in bad data. So in the murder of Pablo Fisas, forensic architecture used fragments of audio and video recordings that they matched together using very, very complex processing in order to disentangle this opaque uh, event. And they arrive to the evidence that uh, this murder happened with the assistance of the police forces, of some members of the police forces in, 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 in that moment in Greece. And of course, this is a very, very shocking conclusion for an art project that is, again, useful as evidence beyond art, beyond aesthetics, and in the realm of public life. But I don't think we should see that as uh, anything different from the rest of the work that we are showing here. It was very important that we see a continuity between public life, the political, scientific uh, ingenuity, technological advancement, artistic desires, impulses and ambitions, and also obsessions. And that all that appears in the same space because I believe this, is, this project as a whole simply witnesses for the uh, collective endeavor we are, we are all committed to, and that is uh, the advancements, advancement of human consciousness. So, speaking about reconstruction, actually, we move into the next uh, part of the exhibition. Uh, the works of Egor Kraft uh, are also reconstructions, and they also use um, neural networks and, and, and machine learning. We are in a different type of reconstruction, but at the same time, nothing is too different here, nothing is uh, similar. Uh, these statues, as you can see, uh, were missing fragments and collaborating with the Strelka Institute in Moscow and the University of Southampton, uh, the artist Egor Kraft managed to create this, um, to establish this protocol of reconstruction, what he, he calls speculative restoration of uh, antique objects uh, in, in statuary. Um, I say the word statuary with a purpose because this is actually the main topic, the second conceptual territory of the exhibition. We speak about statuary because in this other, um, the second half of the show, we are interested in um, the encounter of contemporary science, technology, and art with the most classical and ancient topics with the most important, uh, let's say, legacy of uh, Western culture, but not only Western, I think uh, all over uh, human history and human cultural history, one can find the concept of statuary as, as a very important function for memory, for our acknowledgement of what is the physical world, the body, what is emblematic to us, etc., etc. The statuary is a field where um, we, um, saw an opportunity to present works of advanced research, technology, advanced collaboration between artists, designers, uh, and scientists, and all that because we feel that there is a classicism to come in all these works. We can, again, from a perspective that is perhaps at the, uh, at the verge of uh, 
our species and the temporality of our species, we can see the um, statues and the monuments of the future, perhaps the near future, perhaps the far future. So uh, these antiques are being seen from the perspective perhaps of a non-human eye, perhaps we will be, um, our projects will be carried out after us by machines who will be then interpreting the classical. They will be reading statues and they will be trying to make sense out of them. Uh, in Egor's craft, in Egorcraft's uh, work, what is really beautiful is that when machines and machine learning uh, devices try to interpret these sculptures, and particularly their missing fragments, they come up with very strange solutions. Sometimes an eye and an ear are merged into a very strange texture. Sometimes a head appears uh, behind the neck of, uh, um, of a statue, and, uh, and, and sometimes a frieze uh, has emergent components that would be unlikely to uh, appear in the, in, 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 in the mind of, of the original sculpture. But I think that gives us an idea of how many possible readings, how many distant uh, interpretations can be uh, triggered by uh, pure machine intelligence. As uh, we uh, pan through the gallery, uh, we are also confronted with the image of a robot. The, uh, this mechanism on wheels, as you see, it's composed of a, a skateboard. It has four wheels uh, and some uh, weight to keep it stable. And then there is some sort of easel. Uh, it is certainly reminiscent of painting history and a double arm, a double pendulum that, as you see now, uh, can rotate uh, at a very, uh, with, like, with a lot of strength and speed and produce this uh, writing. It's certainly senseless or asemic writing, um, at least for us it is asemic. It can be read as pure gesture. I think it, it is something um, that is midway between uh, like machine-based uh, uh, vandalism and um, assisted abstract expressionism. It is something that um, brings us also close to the tradition of uh, mural painting and fresco, but of course to the contemporary practice of graffiti. This is the work of uh, Takahiro Yamaguchi and Sokano, two Japanese practitioners in, uh, also in art and technology. And uh, the senseless drawing bot was made uh, in 2011 uh, in the first iteration and then it has been perfected and developed over the years. We are very happy to have uh, the senseless bot operating live in the exhibition. Again, another reason to come visit the show is that you will see the robot. Uh, painting. At the end, uh, in the next uh, three and a half weeks, we will probably have an incredible mural uh, made by this bot. And um, mechanical uh, drawing and chromatism are also uh, at the center of the next project. If we continue through the room, we'll see um, the project Digi Digital Vogue by uh, Julia Kerner. Um, Julia is a designer uh, based in Los Angeles, but she's originally from Austria where she studied uh, the first part of uh, her education uh, happened there at uh, Angevante, but then she studied uh, in parametric design at UCLA where she still teaches. And uh, this project, Digital Vogue, um, takes as a starting point, again, life and its encoding of fabulous combinations of information, of sensory information. In this case, it's the, on the wings of the Madagascan uh, sunset butterfly, a fairly large animal that has um, really complex wing textures. Uh, some parts are very hairy, others velvety, others very compact. Um, and the filaments of, of, of these butterfly wings are also very complex in color. So using that uh, biologi biologi biological reference as an inspiration, Julia Kerner worked with uh, the company Stratasys, who is a, an experimental company working with digital uh, 3D printing. And they developed this technology to print directly on fabric, uh, on fabric, but what it's printed is not stains and it's not just a sheer um, monochromatic volume, it is polychromed filaments. And 
a very large multiplicity of textures can be uh, found in this uh, in, in, in this procedure. The uh, what we show in the in, in the gallery here at State Studio is a uh, sampler of some of the most striking uh, tests in this technology, and then a larger sample of the SETE jacket that uh, Julia Corner developed in collaboration with Stratasys. This is a, a very beautiful uh, piece of attire that creates this second skin. Um, it is actually uh, a fur for the human body, a, a, a synthetic fur uh, imitating, reproducing the, um, the textures of the Madagascan sunset butterfly. It's a very compelling project and again, very tangible, very physical outcome of hardcore digital research. The last work um, in, in, in this itinerary I've created, which of course is one of many itineraries, you might as well come to the show and start from the very top and then go uh, exactly at will uh, from one work to the other, exactly as a butterfly. Um, here what you're seeing uh, and it's just behind me here um, is the magnetic motion dress and uh, attire collection by Iris Van Herpen. Um, Van Herpen is a designer acclaimed for her haute couture uh, designs. She runs uh, uh, a studio in the Netherlands where the uh, craftsmanship and at the same time the inspiration of science come together. This work she developed with uh, Jolan van der Wiel and uh, Philip Beasley, architect and artists uh, that collaborated with her in magnetic motion. Um, the main inspiration for this series was actually a visit that Iris Van Herpen did to uh, CERN, to the Large Hadron Collider. And what was most striking to, striking to her, uh, based on uh, her account of, of the event, was the realization that she was uh, entering a space where the magnetic, magnetic field uh, was uh, being produced at 20,000 times the power of the Earth's magnetic field. And that impression she brought into this collection of ready-to-wear uh, um, garments and, and dresses, shoes. We have here two examples of, uh, of, of this production. I think it's a very uh, good way to conclude um, this tour because magneticism, uh, an invisible force giving shape to very tangible, invisible, and audible things and uh, a force going through the entire uh, universe and allowing us to navigate many, many layers of existence, of knowledge, of human production. Uh, well, I think that the idea, that idea of the magneticism of the magnetic is, um, is, is very compelling and very representative of the way we have been drawn into this project, into this research uh, in near futures quasi-worlds, and I hope you will be also uh, magnetically driven to, to State Studio for uh, uh, a visit in the coming days until July 26, the show will be on view. This was all uh, from uh, my part. Uh, thank you very much for uh, watching and listening uh, to all those who stayed uh, in front of the screen. And I'm very happy to uh, now uh, uh, announce the next event. It will be the Start Talk uh, with a number of uh, amazing guests. I invite you to continue and stay tuned, uh, continue on this event. And I hope uh, I will see many of you this evening live at State Studio. Thank you.
Hey. Hello to everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to um, a start event that I'm very honored to be participating. And I want to thank uh, DigiConnect, the European Commission, and of course all the organizers that uh, have me among excellent, uh, excellent speakers to talk about art, uh, technology and science. As an architect myself, but also a politician, I'm chairing the uh, think tank basically of the parliament, uh, which is uh, the science technology uh, based one, focused one. We have done recently a big study on how digital transformation is also changing the creative sector. Um, we have studies that are available on, on the impact that the digitalization might have to um, to creators and to create basically new value. Um, so for me, artistic expression has always been uh, part of, of what I do and my understanding. Um, it's not that easy though to pass the same message to the European Parliament when they draft budgets. So now I'm also in the, in the budget committee and trying to show the value that we have in the creative sector and uh, that uh, we have to use START as basically um, an ideal prototype for what we have succeeded and that we have to extend and expand. So it's an exercise of how creativity and uh, science technology um, can become a catalyst for new value, especially in the uh, digital era now that we have artificial intelligence uh, being a top priority also for the European Commission. Uh, this means that uh, we would like, since now uh, we are opening the consultation for digital skills, creativity and problem-solving mentality is uh, what we will, will definitely be in need. So um, I think that drafting also the budgets of the MFF under this uh, prism would um, help us uh, allow and support creators to test themselves or to invent new technologies and uh, to also have cross-border um, interaction. I, uh, I don't think I need to talk about all these technologies because we do have, um, we've seen the deep fakes, we, we've seen um, augmented reality, we have seen how you can have now movies on uh, that the, the trailers are made by artificial intelligence. You have 3D sculptures on the internet and you can like actually paint them and, and watch the video of like uh, the creator um, creating um, these sculptures. And, and in music, we have also called the challenges that tries in, in our uh, side. So imagine if you have to put copyright, intellectual property, uh, as something that an artificial intelligence system, an algorithm has created. So there are challenges, but this uh, is definitely a positive disruption. So um, I would like to give immediately the floor to our excellent uh, speakers. I will start with Simon Zeni. Um, he has um, exhibiting himself everywhere around the world about the social and political impact for the extraordinary technologies from blockchain to artificial intelligence with uh, installations that are definitely um, worth to see. So, Simon Denny, your CV is uh, quite big and the places you have exhibited there are like so many all over the world actually, I would say, so you have a global impact. And I would like to give you first the floor uh, um, because your input, uh, being part of this pro project is really important and trust me, this will uh, help us raise awareness among politicians in order to support and expand this amazing uh, pr uh, project that also happens to create your creativity. If politicians are really good into creating also some problems, we will try to do the opposite here, to, to have an example for uh, for, um, for everybody. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva, and thanks to Starts um, and everybody here. Also, I remember meeting Eva on a uh, Starts-sponsored, uh, or semi-Starts-sponsored uh, intervention I did at the European Parliament uh, some years ago. So thanks for that as well. Um, I've just brought, for those who are not aware of things that I've done, a couple of examples. I won't take up too much time because we have so many uh, esteemed people uh, speaking here. Um, but essentially, I wanted to introduce a couple of projects so people know what I do. Um, Actually, it flows on very well from uh, Vlad Njola, another guest that you guys had uh, a couple, like I think yesterday speaking. Um, 
Because uh, their anatomy of an AI system, uh, a research project uh, Vladen did with Kate Crawford from the AI Now Institute in uh, NYU, um, uh, was the kind of beginning for a piece that I made about uh, this object, which is um, a, a cage that Amazon.com uh, patented um, in 2016 um, for uh, workers to go on their robotic systems in their warehouses. Um, this is some... Uh, uh, I guess, press noise that was generated um, uh, when Vladen and Kate uh, released their research. Um, and uh, I saw this patent then, and I thought, wow, what an amazing object. Um, uh, if, uh, for those of you that don't know, Amazon is very highly roboticized in their, um, in their uh, warehouses, and they have these kind of little robot cars that move around giant, um, I guess, uh, uh, shelving units. Um, and usually that's like a people-less zone. Uh, but Amazon wanted to have a cage so that uh, they could put uh, people on top of these robots uh, and enter into this dangerous, algorithmic, uh, people-free zone. Um, but obviously, uh, it also has a kind of weirdly poetic uh, conversation about uh, what the role of workers in uh, conversation with, let's say, or, uh, yeah, AI um, is, uh, and uh, where uh, workers' roles, human workers' roles, play uh, in these systems of uh, power. Um, and so I thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to kind of see this as an object? So I went to my uh, local um, uh, uh, workshop and um, put together this uh, uh, kind of version of the cage from uh, this drawing. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, but that wasn't the only thing uh, that I wanted to kind of highlight in this project. Um, I wanted to put something inside the cage to also kind of activate some of these questions around uh, who is um, in power in these systems and, and what happens there. So um, oh, there's a few angles. I kept the, the diagrammatic uh, lines in as a kind of sculptural reminder of its speculative patent legal context. Um, so it's a kind of weirdly uncanny object to stand in front of. Um, but I was also on dialogue. I made this show and this artwork in Australia, in Tasmania, and I was in dialogue with some scientists down there um, who uh, are working on raising awareness of extinction and uh, various different um, yeah, birds that are becoming extinct. And we talked about a King Island brown thornbill, a very rare bird uh, in Tasmania, which um, uh, yeah, sits itself uh, in, in, in former forests that are now farmland, and there's only sort of something like 30 birds like this left, and um, there was only a very few images of such a bird, um, and so I worked with the scientists to uh, try and capture some more images and some uh, sounds of the bird uh, to highlight this, um, this kind of rapid extinction which is happening all over the world, but also in Australia, um, and uh, we managed to capture this amazing sound. Um, of this bird, and, uh, and also some images, so we were able to make an augmented reality version of the bird, uh, which kind of goes inside the cage, a little bit like a um, Pokemon Go. So here you have uh, um, a view of the screen of uh, this King Island brown thornbill, this almost extinct bird, flying around inside this Amazon worker cage. And for me, this was something to focus on the very important issues of uh, who is working for whom, uh, what automated systems do, um, who gets compensated for what uh, in this kind of changing work of world, uh, world of uh, work and uh, technology. Um, and uh, here you can see kind of how the work functions. Um, you have uh, a number of people coming in with their phones, looking at this empty worker cage. And then uh, because the audio was uh, kind of out loud, you could hear this kind of flock of birds, but there was this kind of incredible absence inside the cage itself. Um, so you really got uh, a kind of more bird calls than uh, one would actually get uh, in the rest of the world. Um, so maybe that's a good uh, intro to my work, and, uh, and maybe we can um, come back to some of that later. You see me, you might be surprised. Um, Eva, unfortunately, uh, she got disconnected. She's not only online, she's also mobile, and this is a bit too much in today's world, even. So uh, I guess I will have to take over for the time being. Perhaps she comes back, perhaps not. Um, I simply take over, so I uh, greet everybody. Uh, and I simply uh, would say uh, perhaps uh, Rebecca would uh, like to say something. Uh, we had yesterday. Uh, Volkswagen, and today we have Siemens, so we have a clear industry presence in Stars, and I think this is very important. 
Uh, Rebecca is, is heading a research group in, in Siemens on artificial intelligence, but I understand she also has a background in media. Uh, and, and I think this is exactly the mixtures we need. So perhaps, Rebecca, you want to say a few words? Um, yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca Johnson. I'm from Scotland in Rurri originally. And normally I would be in some factory setting, but as these times are, I'm at home. Um, I originally studied multimedia management, but I head a research group at Siemens, which deals with new technologies and prototyping with our partners from healthcare, from the industry, from IoT, um, where we look at the new user experience that is caused with the new technology. If you look at AI technology in the past few years, or 3D technology, augmented reality, virtual reality, you'll see the systems we work with, we're moving away from mouse and keyboard. The systems understand us, they're expressive, they're empathic with sentiment detection. With uh, their eloquent and with generative design, they have become creative. And we notice that our engineers um, cannot engineer as fast as artificial intelligence and cannot test their creations against um, our security rules, for example, or design rules such as a style guide and web design. And so together with our partners who are less um, um, involved in the technology itself, we prototype um, solutions that are a sensible use of the, um, of the, the technology in their area. That's me. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, perhaps we can switch now. Uh, we mix uh, between art and, and technology. We switch to Ralph. Um, uh, I, I saw before I saw Ralph. I saw his work in in Linz at Ars Electronica Festival, and I was fascinated by his work. And and I was hoping he would indeed uh, come to this uh, state exhibition. And indeed, one of his works is there. It's a work which which reflects a lot on on the use of AI on the on the use of uh, of the digital and uh, I would like to give the floor to, to Ralph Becker uh, for a short comment. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yes, my name is Ralph Becker. I have a background in computer science and electrical engineering, and then kind of got bored of that and went to to art school. And um, I was actually, so my work is basically trying to dig into these black boxes that, let's say, science and the industry creates and look at the fundamental layers, how digital processes operate and create images. And so that's what's actually what I'm doing over the years, also looking at the materiality of the digital, kind of what is the physical layer of the image or the a digital process that we see, for instance, looking at silicon or um, the raw physical commodities of a nowadays technology. And over the years, I was kind of exploring this as some kind of artistic research practice and where I see my, my, my work more or less as some kind of experiment in order to explore these non-spaces, these digital spaces, and bring them into sculptural, um, physical spaces. And that's kind of happening What's in, in, in most of my installations. And uh, furthermore, I'm teaching at the University in the Arts in Bremen in a program for digital media, which, which is a collabor collaboration between the University in Bremen and the Art School in Bremen. So it's kind of where both sides actually, like the technology-driven and the art and design-driven parts come together in one program. And I'm teaching there as a professor for experimental design and new technologies. Oh, that's maybe my first. Thank you, Thank you Ralph. So uh, finally, uh, Paul. Uh, I know Paul since uh, quite some time, uh, from the times of complex system science, uh, and he switched now to, to AI and, and he brings, I guess, ideas of complex system science to AI. Uh, he's running a project called Humane AI, which of course is very similar in spirit to, to the topic of this conference, which is empathic AI. Uh, Paul, perhaps you want to say how you see humane AI, empathic AI, and perhaps the role of arts in it. Yeah, so great being here. Uh, so I have a background in computer science and in physics, and I've been working in more than 20 years, I, I call it, at systems that are the boundary of the digital and the physical world. So a lot of wearables, Internet of Things, 
And the question, how can a computer system actually, and I don't like to say, say understand, because computers don't understand. How can systems model what is happening in the real world and then interact with the real world? So part of it, when I know Ralph from was the complexity, how can computer systems deal with the complexity of human interactions? But also, how can the systems understand what humans do and influence it? And I often had contact with arts, wearable computing, a lot with fashion designers. Um, but also, I'm very often asked, you see now computer systems doing things that we consider inherently human, you know, finishing symphonies. Uh, I think Ifa mentioned it, the sculptures and painting. So people ask, are computers creative? Are the computing competing with humans? And that's something that sort of triggers me. Because a computer is a bunch of switches, nothing more. A computer can never ever, at least not the computers we have to do, be in any form creative. What the AI today does is statistical analysis and numerical optimization on huge amounts of data. And the fascinating thing is how many of the things that we consider to be inherent to humans, human, can be mapped onto statistical analysis, right? So you look at a piece of music, you do advanced statistical analysis and you recreate data that has the same statistical distribution and humans think it's a piece of music written by Beethoven or someone. But in the end, there is zero creativity there. It's statistical analysis. I think it's really important. You know, people ask, today AI system, can they actually program themselves? And my answer is, since the early days, humans wanted to believe in magic. There was a time you would dance to create rain. And now people think AI can program itself. It's absolutely the same thing. And the final thing, what I believe is the true value of AI, is to be a tool that had enhanced human capabilities. And that's what humane AI is about. It's about creating AI that will not replace humans, but that humans can use as a tool, and not a simple tool, but something that adapts to us, that really helps us do and achieve things and become what we could not do, achieve, or become without the support of AI. That's it. Thank you, Paul. Well, you mentioned an interesting aspect that the, the title of this panel is Art Beyond Digital. And it is interesting to think, um, as you correctly pointed out, AI today is mainly machine learning, right? It is, uh, so it is search of statistical patterns in data. And yet, this type of, a, of machine learning creates music, art like music, it creates artworks, Van Gogh like paintings. And yet, we all seem to agree that this is not art. So, so in which way is art going beyond digital here? Uh, some people say it's meaning that art gives, some people say uh, it's emotion. Uh, I, I think. Even though we agree that, that these Bach compositions or these, these Van Gogh type paintings are not art, they erase questions, I think, about creativity also. And, and, and what would the artists think in this respect? Simon and Ralph. Oh, I mean, that, that's, that's really difficult. I mean, I have been following like this AR discussion over the years, and I, I'm, I honestly have to say, um, I. I'm interested in these breaks, like when you see when these algorithms fail, like these, the images that are kind of in between this creating the perfect um, um, Van Gogh replica, like these strange images that kind of produce a new aesthetics that's beyond, like let's say, what a human could come up with. And, and for sure, like the dialogue of a human with these kind of algorithms is maybe able to find very interesting new aesthetics and um, strange images that are kind of kind of locked up into these statistical um, analysis in the machine. And probably I would I would totally agree. Like there's like this dialogue or like um, I don't know how, I can't remember how you called it, but like this. Uh, humans or artists kind of working with these um, algorithms together and kind of to, to dig out really strange images that could have not been explored through um, by the algorithm alone or by the artist alone. Yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of so much uh, great art that's done in the space, looking critically at what these systems do and what biases are kind of baked in with them and how we can kind of uh, improve thinking about AI. I think um, for me, uh, art is useful as a kind of experimental space to um, test 
things speculatively. I guess um, I'm thinking of work by, you know, Martin Sims, uh, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, uh, Trevor Paglin, uh, Agnieszka Courant, who we've had on this uh, panel as well. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, examples of how artists can um, do uh, things uh, with AI that uh, wouldn't seem obvious to people with other types of training. And I think uh, one of the key things that I noticed from my vantage point is, um, is about access and literacy to understanding how these systems work. So we have uh, scientists on this panel um, and uh, an artist that works actively to kind of promote things between science and arts. I think um, uh, ha having people understand how those systems work who usually wouldn't and have voices in them uh, in, the, in the making and giving feedback to the systems who usually can't, I think that's, um, that's something really valuable that art can create a space for. So one thing I learned about art as a computer nerd at a certain stage is that art is not really only about how the object looks or sound, it's about the process that went into its creation. So I remember being in a wearable computing, I used to laugh at fashion people and saying fashion is just, you know, apply, applied hysteria. Because one year red is in, the next year blue is in. I mean, why should the, the, the same electromagnetic wavelength be good one year and bad next year? And then essentially people explain to me that what happens is that essentially fashion designers have a sense for, for let's say, something like trends, how people feel, how the world and this year makes them feel, and they translate it in, into appearance. And that makes sense. And, and of course, this process of, of you know translating things that you pick up and, and into some sort of an appearance is what art really is. In the end, the picture that has been produced, which is just a distribution of different absorption patterns for electromagnetic waves, uh, you know, is, is what a computer can create. So it creates an absorption pattern that have a similar statistical distribution to Van Gogh's picture. But the entire artistic process of creating that picture is something that the machine does not do, replicate. On the other hand, See, I, by this, yeah. yeah I disagree. <laughs> I think the brain is a bunch of switches. <laughs> How is it something different? And the data, the statistic you're talking about is human experience. And if an artist grows up in Ireland, everything will be green. And if an artist grows up in Greece, everything will be turquoise. So if Van Gogh is painting what he sees from his experience, he's inspired to create a piece of art. And if you digitize the inspiration, it's the same as what well, I mean. I'm, no offense, but it's, it's it is uh, extracted from experience, which would um, replicate a big storage of data that someone's put together. Okay, so I, I didn't want to raise this question because I, uh, that is something you know. I feel comfortable about feeling how computers create art because that is fact. Uh, now I want to go to thinking: what is human creativity and what is a human brain? You, you get into phys philosophical territory. Coming from physics, I do have the tendency of saying the branch is just a bunch, brain is just a bunch of switches. They just work in a different way. Yes. Right? So that was go very deeply into my heart. Uh, but, but you know, this is a subject where, where you get into philosophical discussions. What is really important for me is that a lot of people really believe that our creativity, what we do as humans, is more than just a Turing a computable thing, which is something I, I, I'm not trying to discuss now. I'm not sure if it is. And what is important for me to say is that no matter what the computer produces, what the computer produces is definitely a result of simple statistic and numerical optimization, nothing more. And especially a computer will never do anything it has not been programmed to do. It can do something uh, that it, you cannot foresee because you, you give them a program to analyze yes. data which you have no clue about. So what this you system extracts from the... You it, can introduce an element of randomness. Yeah, okay, but that's not like programming yourself. You can say you can always do build a machine that is random, right? So, yeah. So you cannot foresee what a computer does, but in this case, you program it to be random. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think there's also yeah, a lot the question we need oh. what, uh, you see, uh, you, you're a physicist, right? So, uh, Jonathan Wheeler once said, uh, it put the computer understands, I would like to understand as well. And I guess this is even more true today with, with AI. And, and, and the problem I see with AI is that uh, it does what it does, as you said, but nobody knows why or how, especially if, if it's based on machine learning. And I guess here also artists can make a difference. And, and, and I'm thinking of Trevor Beglin, who I think lives also in Berlin who has been thinking about 
the inner workings of face, face recognition algorithm, for example, in order to understand how these computers arrive at the conclusions they arrive. And I think this is a very important aspect for uh, where art comes in. You see, to make AI or digital in general, perhaps understandable. I think Simon has been working on these things uh, and, and also Ralph, perhaps. Yeah, I think so. Would you agree, Paul and, and Rebecca, that this, this notion of understandable or explainable AI, I guess, is the term, is something we're looking where a art lot of, uh, makes We look a lot at explainable AI, but again, I have to refer back to the experience. If my two year old draws anything with four legs, it's a cow because all she knows is cows. So, and we say neural networks are comparable to a two year old. and. She also can't tell a cat from a dog because it's got four legs and, a, and ears and a face. And so if you look at the data she has, it does explain why her art, if it's allowed to be considered art, um, is going to be cows, dogs and cats. I mean, I think that points think to... Oh. Yeah, come on, please. Sorry. Uh, I think that points to a really important um, thing that I see in... Uh, if Ralph brings up Trevor's work, um, and if you're talking about your... Uh, the perception of your child compared to our, like the perception of the way that uh, uh, computers process things uh, in neural nets or uh, whatever learning systems. Um, uh, I think uh, the work is to, uh, for artists that I think uh, fascinates a lot of people that I know is to kind of find uh, the ways in which systems don't translate and things that are unconsciously in there that are perhaps not intended or not visible to the maker, right? So I think the work of, uh, of, of Trevor's looking at um, how uh, training sets have been biased uh, for you know decades, and the beginnings of the inputs into making uh, uh, you know uh, neural nets and these kinds of machine learning systems um, obviously used training sets which didn't speak for uh, a great number of people, and also kind of trained uh, things in a direction where they uh, they just simply didn't recognize certain forms of life. And I think I think one of the benefits that artists can offer perhaps is um, some oxygen in these situations where. Uh, you know, uh, from my perspective, you know, specialized fields, including art, can sometimes not not see the things that are uh, uh, are not included in the ways that they model the world. Um, and I think maybe that's relating to your child's drawing too. It's uh, as as you say, it's um, uh, she is perceiving and kind of communicating uh, what she's experiencing in a different way. And uh, in order to have a rich understanding of what's going on in the world, uh, models should include that way of understanding a cow. Yeah, perhaps we should. Uh, um, Paul was mentioning the, the, the idea that artists take up the wipes, at least the fashion designers, he said, take up the wipes of society, the feelings of society. And I think, especially in the age of social media, this is, this is of course an issue. Artists have uh, thought about the impact of social media. Um, Rebecca, would you, when you, you have a background in internet and social media, how do you see this, yeah. this, this real eye of the artist in social media? Well I, I, well, I worry personally because um, I would say artists don't create arts to be likable by users. And if we, ta if we start bringing in <coughs> user feedback, then, then um, the, the, it's, it's being manufactured, it's not creative anymore. It's just creating something to the desires and likability of some community. If we start liking and voting everything, It'll, it'll become extremely biased and the creativeness will go lost. I'm, as far as I know, artists don't become uh, artists to become rich and loved by everyone. <laughs> they need to express something and it just needs to get out of their system. So I, personally, I'm worried about communities in art. But what I like, as, as also you said, what artists do essentially, the process they have in a substitute way, right? You could say like this black block machine learning thing that somehow feel the vibes and, and they produce something, which is nothing more than processing this data in a very complex way. And what AI can do in the digital world is, is to infinitely enhance the type and amount of data that they can take in, right? It can show them connections. It can show them things that they did not see before. That is what we look at in, in, in by meaning by AI enhancing human capabilities. You, you can think about it like the Superman X-ray vision. It allows you to see yes. things you have not been able to see before and, and then process them because that is what AI can do. It can, can see things in a huge amount of data that are totally obvious for you because they're complex. 
I agree yeah, completely. Well, well, AI will not replace it. Turns us into superhuman demigods, but it will never replace us. I wanted to add one. What I was referring to is that artists are having a critical eye on social media. I, I'm thinking of, of, of what Simon, Simon did, for example, at the Biennale in Venice, where he talked about surveillance and privacy, or what, what, what uh, Ralph has been doing. So perhaps, what is the artist's view on, on how you link to social media and how you have a critical eye on social media? I wanted to add just one thing because it was you were talking about this. The brain is just a, a couple of switches, but then it's a couple of switches kind of immersed in 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 in, in, in chemistry that is kind of totally yes, with a heart. With a heart, and you know. So for me, like the one important element, if it's either like a critical approach towards AI or looking at aesthetics and aesthetical research, like there's always kind of like this idea of intuition for. I don't know wherever intuition is kind of can be mapped inside such a um, um, system or also doing a really good mistake. So I think a good artwork is kind of doing really, really good mistake. So thinking everything through and then being brave enough to do this like this and to, 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 to against all computational or logical uh, um, um, results, let's say. And um, I think. That's something that we should uh, appreciate. That what art does, like just doing really good mistakes, and um, and something that um, a machine um, can't do. At that, at that thing. Yeah. So I agree on the discussion really about what is the human creative process. What is it that people may argue only a human can do? Is an extremely interesting discussion. My point was that nothing of it that we know very clearly what a computer does when it creates art right so whatever it may be that humans has a special thing current ai is nowhere on the way of any, having anything of it right it's like this fantasies that people have about ai taking over the world i mean a, a, a simple equation doesn't wake up one day and say you know i want to take over the world an equation is an equation and will always be an equation uh, it can be extremely powerful uh, and, and one thing I really feel arts can do for AI is that a lot of the mistakes, a lot of the problems, a lot of the capabilities that AI have are very difficult to explain to people outside the expert community, right? And I think arts is a beautiful way of highlighting these things. For example, example explaining people that yes, this AI can understand what you're talking about, but just it's just a stupid box of switches. And the type, if you, if you show them these this pictures where you have these this nice mistakes, that's right? so really highlighting the limits and the opportunities of the technology in a way that is intuitively perceived by the general public is something which art is extremely good with. I think also to the point yeah, of- we are the direction, yes. Simon? That's why I like this cage thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I think to the point of the social media question and the question of community and, uh, how social media has changed artistic communities and discourses. I think the important thing to keep in mind when critiquing this is that, uh, you know, art has always been a social embedded uh, phenomenon. And, uh, you know, uh, communities legitimate and proliferate artwork and have always done. So certain artworks by certain people are kind of socialized and promoted and talked about. And that's not just a, a merit-based system that's also something to do with whom communities are made up of and, and where power lies. And I think um, if we kind of look to social media and say this is a dangerous space where um, there can be so much uh, noise or, uh, you know, uh, looking for kind of popular appeal and, uh, and feedback on those systems, I would argue that they have always been a part of making art. That's not a new phenomenon. It's just a case of, uh, of uh, who is, uh, I guess, legitimizing and uh, proliferating the, uh, the artwork. Um, so let me maybe add a different perspective I was thinking about. For me, one of the explanation of words, or, or my personal ones of what could be art beyond just, you know, switches coming together comes from essentially complex systems, right? So saying this thing, if you have enough things that are cooperating, you get this emergent phenomena, which per definition you cannot predict because you would have to be able to measure infinitely and, and, and things like that. Uh, and if you now imagine social systems, social media, where parts of the interacting entities are now AI, then you increase the complexity of the connections in the system, the speed of the connections with the system, which coming from complex systems means that you get more emergent properties, you, you get more, uh, more phase uh, transitions, things like that. 
And I think that's an important thing to understand about AI in society, and maybe in art, that AI can actually introduce another level of unpredictability, and in, maybe in this way, creativity, right? Sounds strange, but by introducing a computer into a system, you don't make it more rigid, you actually make it more creative and unpredictable, because you sort of change the emergent properties of the system. Totally relate to that. Well, the famous example of computer crashes on the financial market, right? The, yes, right. exactly. Yeah, I think, I think the point you raise from the complex system perspective on a holistic view is important. And I think also here artists can, can help because artists, I would say, by nature have a more holistic view of things than, than engineers who tend to focus on the bits and pieces of the system. Uh, Uh, should we perhaps, uh, um, I was a bit surprised that you said the uh, brain is nothing else but switches. Uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes in AI was to call a neural net a neural net. Yes. But frankly speaking, it's a rather simple mathematical object and it was inspired by our understanding 50 years ago of what, how the brain works. So if people say today the brain is the neural net is like the human brain. They, they refer to our understanding of the brain 50 years ago. Uh, and, and I think this makes a lot of, uh, of, of pro this makes lots of problems in, in, in the way you communicate AI, because AI by many is associated with the brain, when in reality it's a mathematical construct AI, especially, especially the neural nets. I, I fully agree. Uh, I, when I teach AI, I, I never start explaining neural networks or some sort of a brain networks, but just start with a mathematical formulation or, or some switch formulation. Um, I think, and I, I, I assume that's also what Rebecca meant, it's not about saying the brain is just a bunch of neurons, but essentially that a brain can eventually be explained away by physics. Uh, down the line, it's some sort of uh, physical object interacting according to a known word, uh, laws of physics. Um, which certainly is not what today neurons or the, let's say the neuro, neuron explanation of the mathematical methods of machine learning are. Right? I mean, this, this neural network and neuron thing is just a human understandable visualization of, of some mathematics that I agree with. So, so it really is distinct to differentiate. No, our brains are not huge neural networks in the sense of AI neural networks. That's rubbish. Uh, but in the end, you have some sort of switch-like or, or store-like physical processes and interactions. Uh, and the big question is, can we do more than Turing computability? And my personal answer, answer is, I don't know. I mean, one, one thing that I have learned is like that the, that the, the brain is always what is a new, new technology. Once it was a clockwork, once it yeah. was a photographic apparatus, then it was a Turing machine and then now it's like a neural network or an AI and so it's 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 always you know like that's what present kind of also feeds our imagination what maybe our own um, perceptual apparatus brain is so it's it, 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 it's only kind of, yeah it's kind of in a feedback loop what we create is what what we become basically but importantly there's also like a cultural lens to this too right like if we say oh it's all switches and shapes and whatever um, this is a this is coming out of a particular discipline and a particular yeah. place coming out of a particular uh, way of looking at the world I think also one of the things that artists are good at reminding us of is there's many ways to see the world uh, and many different places where culture is made um, and I think to uh, to I, I would push back a little bit on the idea that uh, a particular kind of physics can eventually describe what it is to be human from uh, because I would argue that there's a perspective and a, and a cultural lens in that in that uh, uh, framework as well I think this is a good uh, this is a very good remark I mean Mary Mitleach a philosopher she was writing a book the myths we live by and she talked essentially about all the science the Darwinian evolution the mechanistic view of the world of the human and indeed, artists can bring in a totally different view and can help us get rid of this, this myths, that we, this scientific myths that we now have to live by. Yes, I really think, and that's what I started my, let's say, my presentation, the way I did is that as a scientist, what you can talk about is what are the things that a machine can achieve with certain accuracy and what are the mechanisms that machine, the machine uses to do that. Right. And I believe that most of the things that we consider human 
we can simulate with very high accuracy using many of current AI mechanisms. And that is essentially the statement. And, and to what degree the human brain function as, as a machine, it can be explained by physics. In one of the things I talk about, not when I have my scientific science uh, hat on me, but you know, when I go to a bar with a couple of friends and, and after the third or the second year, uh, those are the things you can speak about, which are fun then, at least as a computer scientist or physicist. Nice. Rebecca? So we don't just look at comparing um, neural networks to the human brain, but also the human to the animal kingdom. Mm. And I would say that a neural network, the, the whole demystification is you need to feed a neural network a bunch of vectors, which means that before that, you've actually done the job of abstracting something mathematically. Like if you want a neural network to tell jokes, then you need to look at jokes and understand that a lot of jokes like, that's what she said, or I like my coffee like I like my Russians, cold or whatever you need um, you need to understand the mathematical uh, formula that's, that causes the joke to be funny or to find something that has a, 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 a pun you know it needs to have a double meaning and the double meaning needs to be as far away from the original meaning as thought and so the human has done the job of abstracting mathematically and I wonder though if we can actually achieve this that which is also what separates us from the animal kingdom, is the ability to abstract mathematically a pattern and then apply it to a different scenario. So you can ask Ziri what's one plus one and she'll answer two, but if you say, I have two apples and Bonnie ate one, how many are left and can I bake an apple cake? She should be able to understand that too, but we're not yet there. And I think that is the next step that's coming and that will bring us what will enhance us more is when we're able to um, transfer this abstraction, the capacity to abstract over to the neural network or the AI technology, what you call it. And it's also about who, who, cap, yeah. No, I would just say like, a little add on to that. Like it's just, it's also about, uh, uh, you're right, it's about defining what a joke is if you're training something, but it's also about who decides what a joke is, right? And uh, and the people that yes. decide to abstract it and translate it into one language might, uh, it might not be the same uh, of every, everybody. So these things are also racialized and geographized and culturalized. And I think that's uh, one of the really important things that artists are very um, focused on is, is how, uh, who makes the decisions right at the beginning of this translation into this abstraction language. Um, ah, and uh, yeah. But, but the more interesting things happen if you completely break these rules in the art. So let's say the, the idea of a ready-made was a completely break with everything that has been existing before in the art world. And it's, but it's still, it, so there is no training set that you can train to come from abstract painting to, um, to, to ready-made. There's no, you, you could not train anything to, to achieve this jump, you know. That's important. I so love I that point because, yeah, would an artist, well, I wonder whether you could get a neural network to actually create the ugly, to create something disturbing. Because we bring the users in um, and emotion recognition because some, um, you can make, uh, it, we, we know that people like symmetry, so you can digitize that. You can test whether the picture is symmetrical. We know that people want stuff all over the, um, the stage, so you would fill up the stage in a web layout. You will always have the logo somewhere on the upper left because we know this is aesthetic. And you can train a neural network to, synthesize use uh, layouts following um, the guidelines of the human taste but to create the disturbing or the ugly or something unexpected i, I really like that point because that that did get me thinking i don't well, they, i yeah, don't or it's, it could do it exactly like or it's <laughs> like a misunderstanding of what beauty is right that like you can't say that beauty yes. is a certain set of aesthetic criteria it's something else and maybe it's saying it's uh, being brave enough to also say that actually science may not understand ever what beauty really means. Yes. And you can translate a certain number of criteria into what becomes beautiful, but you may never be able to create, you know, a sublime feeling or something like that in humans, um, simply by uh, something that can be automated. Yeah. I mean, that, I, that's something I would actually strongly disagree with. <laughs> I, I would assume that if you, you know, showed your system sufficient number of things that are ugly, it would be generating ugly. And if and if the same thing was that like music, stops. If you if you essentially show the system a sufficient amount of things uh, that that are beautiful, 
they're likely to get it to generate beautiful things because this is the thing about pattern recognition there you know there is a pattern and i think the big there are two big questions of course the first one is and and that is the big problem of ai that ai always sees and is trained on a small window on the on the, on the world right you know? it's, it's this this parable with seeing just shadows and the, the GI, ai always is a very little shadow when we think, when we talk, when we make decisions, we base it on a huge amount of experience of connecting things, right? And the computer doesn't have it. You show a computer a bunch of pictures to generate a beautiful picture, it would generate beauty as defined by the data set it was given. Right. And if there are things that are not in a data set, then this will not work. And, and I think this is the problem, you know? I, I give my students this example. You know, speech recognition can do a lot. Now imagine a, a situation in a restaurant when a waiter comes, bring in, uh, bring in the salad and, and the meat, and says, where's the salad, where's the meat? And then the lady said, oh, I'm the rabbit, right? So obviously, immediately the waiter knows who gets the salad. And there are also a lot of other connotations that are raised by that, right? And, and the point is that a computer will currently not understand it because that connotation is based on a huge sea of experience that we have, our world model. And that's a big problem in AI. How do you transfer this human-like offer fuzzy world models that connect things that are loosely connected, strongly connected, sometimes like contradictory, for the machine to use as a background? Luke Steeles was referring yesterday to this distinction, machine learning versus symbolic AI. And, and he claims, well, if you bring the two together, sort of, this will be the next big breakthrough. So to have, for example, if you think about the example of Rebecca on chokes, uh, I don't know, did anybody ever try to feed the neural network chokes and then it spit out chokes? Or would it be necessary? Yes. Huh? Probably yeah, a lot of people, did. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You did? You did two jokes? And, yeah, uh, yes, we had one great joke. We had 2,000 yeah. bad jokes, mm -hmm. and one was quite good. But it was based on machine learning, or it was based on some other way of, of, of training? Yeah, we, we, fed, we fed it a million jokes, and then the joke it came up with was, what would you call a small elephant? And then it says, irrelevant. And that was, ah. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> I'm going to use it. But this is like one of 2,000. And, it and it's very similar to the one that right? yeah. yeah. No, it did. It did. That's what needed feedback. But, but, but that, that's kind of like this exploring this millions of uh, proposals that the algorithm creates. It's like the, 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 the library of Babel where you have to really dig into them. And, uh, we actually, we found that because we're using generative design to create a number of layouts, as I said, and you're going to hate most of them. And so we then had to, so, you know, it's great that Autodesk says you can generate 2000 um, designs in the same time as a designer can only design one. But how do you navigate through 2000 designs? So at the moment we're copying Tinder. So you swipe left, swipe right, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left, swipe right. And that's what we're doing at the moment, but it just it just brought us to the next challenge of actually selecting. Well, that's an awful system. I'm glad you're looking into that one. It could be optimized a little Tell better. Tell my boyfriend. <laughs> uh, I like this thing about symbolic and, and uh, AI and machine learning. They're often shown as things that are opposite, but in a way they are not. They're just two ways of inputting knowledge into a machine. Symbolic AI is essentially assumes what I input into machine is high quality knowledge as it has been performed by human. So the advantage is what you input the machine actual is high quality. The disadvantage is it doesn't scale because you don't have enough humans to actually input the knowledge and it may be conflicting. Machine learning is the opposite thing. You say, okay, I don't care about quality what I put into the machine. I care about the amount and scaling, right? So I put into the, when I use machine learning, I can just feed an infinite amount of data in the machine and let the machine extract something out of it. So I do extract something, but I don't know what it is. And now bringing the two together, you know, having human high quality knowledge input the machine, have them think from a huge amount of data, and then click the two together. And, and then you really get something that makes sense. Yeah, but you always feed uh, human knowledge into the machine, right? When you do machine learning, or most of the time you do that, right? Or well, well, you, you, you feed data. I mean, the only That's exception I know is there's, there's Alpha Zero of Google, the chess machine, and it taught itself playing chess without ever having 
seen a, a game played by a human. Yeah, but it's, it was also generating data. It was randomly generating data and learning. So this data, so again, this thing, it had a low quality thing from which it, it, it learned something right. and, and statistics. It's a good, very often given as an example of, 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 you know, creativity, machine learning something, but in the end, it's just an advanced example of, of, of really doing statistics and, and something. But this combining AI, so the problem when you feed machines human knowledge is, the same as the advantage, it's human knowledge. So it's good, but it also is sort of constrained in a scope, right? You never teach the machine more that you know yourself. If you let the machine learn by itself, you give it data, so it actually discovers things that you did not know, but in a way you can put it into relation to other things. And I think talking about machines enabling humans, I think that's a really interesting thing. Machines discovered things we didn't know, and we use our advanced experience and world model to put them in the right context and maybe feed it back to the machine so that the machine can use it to discover more. I was just reminded of this different forms of knowledge. I don't know, um, Michel Polanyi, like this explicit knowledge implicit, uh, or implicit knowledge, tacit knowledge. So and probably uh, the survey arts is all in this um, implicit knowledge, so knowledge that you can't really translate. You can't, you can't tell someone how to play a violin, how to ride a bicycle, you know, or how to what is how to make a good artwork or whatever. And you know, like this explicit knowledge is all what you what is probably also can be mapped in the symbolic AI. Um, so something that can be written uh, written down and can be explained and can be translated, copied from one brain to the next brain, and then um, so. I know it from teaching design and art practices. Look, you, you, I can't give the, the students like, okay, this is how to do good, right. good design, or this is how to do good. And it's just like practicing, practicing for years of years of kind of training or doing mistakes and learning from the mistakes. And so, in a, in a way, um, so ex, ex, uh, symbolic AI, as I understand, it's just there's knowledge that you can map in a database and then applies through statistical rules. But there's no expert or symbolic AI system, let's say, for an artistic practice. Or it would be interesting to to look at one of these. I, I know that there are a lot of for medicine. Or there are a lot of things like this. But um, are there any approaches? Or I don't know. That would be interesting to me. I mean, in a way, what I what I like if you look at the approach that something like AlphaGo, the Go playing program, took. For me, it was very simple similar to what humans do. So what it did essentially, it couldn't do it couldn't do brute force search like the chess problem did. So it used a neural network, statistics essentially, to learn which paths in what you are searching for might be interesting. And look what you do as a human, right? You look for a solution. You never have the straight path. You search, you try things out, but you don't search blindly. You use your experience to go down the paths that are promising. And that's exactly what a system did, right? You use experience, machine learning, to decide which paths to go down. And then when you go, in most cases, you don't explore the path till the end, but relatively early, you see, ah, no, it's a bad idea. That's what AlphaGoGo did. They had a second network, which was sort of like this evaluation network that would allow them to, to see, again, based on machine learning, whether this path that is taken is promising or not. So in a way, that is what I, I thought fascinating about this, this AlphaGo appro approach is that in a way you could see the general way of approaching things is very similar to humans. In a way, it was how we humans solve creative problems. How do you define a new physical theory? It doesn't like appear to you. you know? Some Mostly kind of intuition. Back, well, what you call intuition essentially is that you have a good, you call it feeling, which path to search. So what you do is based on your experience, you direct your search, which is exactly what the machine did. Based on experience, a lot of data which humans did not understand, it directed its search. Right? So maybe intuition is sort of a probabilistic estimate of which paths of the search can be promising. I'm, I'm told our beyond the art is beyond time. So we, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, perhaps we can all have uh, we can have afterwards, we can discuss in absence of an audience, of course. For the time being, perhaps everybody wants to make a famous last words. Uh, we start with, uh, I don't know, Rebecca. 
Um, this was great fun because there was zero industrial context. <laughs> so it was <laughs> quite different from my normal daily job. So I'm honored and pleased to be in this round. Well, I, I should say that Dart has an industrial context, right? So if this didn't come out, we are, but I, I, I'm, I'm kind of happy, right? So, uh, Simon? Yeah, I'm also just grateful to be able to be speaking to people who know so many different things than I do. So thank you for your time and thank you for the uh, uh, organization of this. It's a uh, total pleasure. Ralph? Well, thank you. Also, thank you very much from my side. Yeah, it was quite interesting to talk to you. Also, the, the, the topic of intuition, maybe it's something that we continue at some point somewhere, maybe in the physical world back then, or hopefully. Thank you very much. All complex systems, last word. Yeah, thanks a lot. I also thought it was interesting. And actually, the system of AI, science, arts, and stuff is a very complex system that makes it fun <laughs> to discuss. And especially the, the thing about intuition, I also think is an interesting question. Yeah, starts makes it even more complex because now there's interactions between AI and art before the world. <laughs> So I thank you, everybody. It was a very interesting uh, uh, experience for me. It was spontaneous because I had to replace Eva Kaili. She wanted to come in again. She just wrote me a message, but uh, there's limits to what we could do. Uh, she sent her greetings, and she's, uh, of course, very happy to, to have at least opened this, this uh, panel. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
So, this was it. Uh, the two-day digital symposium Empathic AI, organized as a collaboration of STARTS together with the German Center of Excellence for the Cultural and Creative Industries, to celebrate five years of STARTS in the context of the festivities of the German EU Presidency 2020, is now uh, coming to a final closing. What have we seen, Manuel? I think it was amazing. We heard, um, I think, uh, uh, an array of interesting voices. And uh, it was very exciting. Uh, all the topics that emerge uh, have a presence in the exhibition. So I think the best thing we can say is that, as you were pointing out before, the digital now should turn a bit physical, a bit more physical. And uh, we should get ready to welcome people uh, visitors uh, uh, during the entire afternoon and evening at State Studio for the opening of the exhibition. We're very happy that the morning uh, was full of exciting ideas and uh, very, very compelling reflections about the near future and the world in the making that we're all involved in right now. So uh, thank you very much to all of you who followed this event. And thank you, Christian. Thank you, Starts, for organizing. And uh, see you soon. Yeah, so as you say, Manuel, um, we're now moving the digital into the physical realm. Uh, just with a few housekeeping notes. So exhibition opening tonight at 6 p.m. here at State Studio. Uh, please remember, um, due to the current restrictions, the exhibition tonight is only accessible with a prior reservation. So if you uh, do have a ticket, uh, we're very much looking forward to welcome you. If you don't have any ticket yet, um, please check our website and the ticket platforms. Tickets uh, might still become available due to can cancellations. Currently, it's booked out. Um, from tomorrow on, the exhibition will be visible um, until July 26, during our opening hours, which is every day except Monday. Uh, from uh, during the week from 12 to 7 and on weekdays from 12 to 5. Well, before we end also, I would like to thank a few people, um, uh, everyone who was involved in the setup of the and organization of the Digital Symposium and also the organization of the uh, exhibition. Uh, to name a few people in specific, um, thank you very much to, to Ralph uh, Doom from Starts Making Everything Possible. Um, a very, very uh, big thank you also to Patricia Delgado uh, from Archer Starts, who has managed and coordinated the exhibition project with great passion and patience. And uh, yeah, she's been holding all the strings together and keeping us on the right track. So thank you for that. Um, thank you also to the German Center of uh, Excellence for the Cultural and Creative Industries, especially Linda uh, Dudasi and Charlene Munze for the fantastic organization of the Digital Symposium. And um, also thank you very much to the State Studio team here, especially Christina Hoge, Veronika Natta and Andrea Familiari for the great uh, production of this amazing show. And last but not least, thank you very much, Manuel, to you and Silvana uh, Fiorese for yeah, allowing us to be following your curation process and hosting this wonderful exhibition here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>